last time we talked about different witnesses to Jesus in the early church, I said something along the lines of, there are lots of different gospels out there, lots of different texts. Well, well, I you said that to try to encourage people to go read these texts for themselves because they're all available, they're all translated, they're all online. Um, I don't think we have anything to fear from these texts. We should study these texts and see what they tell us about what early Christians thought about Jesus and the earliest Christian movement. But I wouldn't want to give the impression that there are just uh, hundreds of, or even dozens of different texts that are all sort of equal. Uh, no one really argues with the fact that our canonical Gospels are, are really the earliest ones. There are only a few, two or three, that you could point to that might creep up into the early 2nd century and might have some connection to the 1st century. Now, one of the ones we're going to look at is the Gospel of Thomas today. I said last time, there, there are scholars who believe that some of the sayings in this gospel, and it's all sayings, all, some of these sayings, which are not found in our canon, might be authentic Jesus. And that probably makes a lot of Christians nervous to think that there's some other source to an authentic saying of Jesus. Well, let's stop and take a look at these because I think it'll help us to just sort of know what's in this text. And, and, and before we can even do that, we need to figure out how can we understand it. There's a, a few sort of key ideas that I think we need to, 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 to have in mind as we approach this text. Um, so first we're going to ask, how does this compare or relate to our canonical Gospels? And then once we establish at least a theory about that, I think we can better ask, how, how do we understand sayings that uh, are a parallel and those sayings that are very different? So we'll take a look at each of those questions. Let me ask a question. Here's my Bible. My Bible only has four Gospels in it. So, sure, there may be some other Gospel out there, but how does it relate to these Gospels, to the canonical Gospels? Well, that's what we're going to try to at least figure out. And to do so, we have to go back into the field of New Testament studies to deal with what's called there the synoptic problem. And it's not a problem other than it's a question of how do Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular relate to one another? Because if you look closely at those Gospels, even in comparison with John, they have a lot of overlap. I mean, if uh, three of my students were to write essays that had that much overlap, I would suspect there's some, let's call it literary relationship between their essays, right? So how are we going to understand the Gospel of Thomas, which also has, as we will see, some overlap, some literary parallels with these Gospels. Well, in New Testament studies, this is called, uh, the, the one way of answering this is called the two-source hypothesis. And what this assumes is that the Gospel of Mark was written first. And we go into why, but basically when you look at Matthew and Luke, they both seem to have shared material that Mark also has, and they follow, in general, Mark's order. But whenever they have stuff that's not covered by Mark, say the birth of Jesus or all the resurrection appearances of Jesus, well, Matthew and Luke go their separate ways and have largely different content. So when they have the same material uh, together, it's usually because it's Markan content. And when they have different material, it must be Matthean or Lucan content. But they're not done because we do have one more area where they do actually share common source, or at least common material, and it's often in the sayings and teachings of Jesus. Even though they show up in different orders in Matthew and Luke, they're almost verbatim often the same sayings, but they're not in Mark. So where did they come from? Well, let's summarize the debate and say, for this hypothesis, they must come from some source, some saying source, uh, we'll call it Q, which is for quell, which is German for source. Now, when you put these things in place, you never found Q. You're looking for some, uh, there must be some Q out there that existed at some time, and then we discover the Gospel of Thomas. And of course, everyone wants to know in 1945, when this text was discovered at Nag Hammadi in Egypt, is this Q? Well, the answer is no, it's not Q. 
if you reconstruct Q from what's in Matthew and Luke, you see a lot of parallels with Thomas, but not exact parallels. It's not the same text. There's additional text uh, in there. There's material in Q not in there. So it can't be the same text. However, it is interesting to see how they relate. Maybe the Gospel of Thomas is also early and maybe also derives some authentic sayings or at least some sayings from this earliest level of tradition. That's how this hypothesis goes. But maybe not. Maybe there was no Q or maybe Q existed and Thomas comes from a parallel tradition. Maybe they both go back to oral tradition. It's really hard to know. I mean, there's all sorts of ways of thinking about how this works. And believe me, this is not where you start on Sunday morning. You don't preach this stuff as if you can just sort of dissect the Bible for people. But when scholars want to look at how they relate, this is the sort of question they have to ask. And so if you're looking at the Gospel of Thomas, this is the sort of thing you might say. Maybe Thomas is later, and maybe it just knows all of our biblical material and does with it what it wants to. But maybe not. Scholars, some scholars are convinced that this text might be an independent tradition that was lost or forgotten or abandoned by most Christians, but it actually records for us sayings that could go back to the earliest oral tradition, maybe even some of the authentic sayings of Jesus. Now, to help us determine whether we buy that sort of theory, or if we're going to say, no, this looks later, this looks like heretical material, well, we've got to sort of see how to compare the sayings that do run parallel, and that'll help us analyze this extra material. Okay, I've encouraged you to read this material, and we're going to try to understand it. But first, let's acknowledge something about how to compare it with our canonical Gospels. When I say you read the Gospel of Thomas, you probably read this in an English translation. You read a modern edition of the Gospel of Thomas, which was translated from actually a Coptic text, an Egyptian text, uh, that was discovered in 1945, may have been written as late as the 4th century. The copy that we have uh, must itself be a translation from a Greek text. And we know this. We have fragments of this gospel in Greek, so we know it originated in Greek. And who knows? If this goes back to maybe oral tradition, or who knows if it as some claim, it goes back to Jesus himself, it would have originally uh, circulated in Aramaic. So what we read when we read the Gospel of Thomas is not the Gospel of Thomas. It's a translation of a translation of a translation. And who knows how much of it passed through and changed in its oral tradition before it got to the form we even discovered it in. Now, we want to compare that with our Bible. But we also have to admit something here. We're probably not reading the Bible. Uh, we're reading a translation of the Bible. We're reading, say, the King James Version. And I, I hope you've moved on to a, uh, something other than the King James Version for most study. But the King James Version, although um, translated from the original Greek, is still influenced by later translations like the Latin Vulgate. But beyond that, we know that the original Greek, when it comes to the words of Jesus, would have originally been spoken in Aramaic. And again, we can trust the sources given to us as an act of faith in our canonical Gospels, but you have to admit what historians see when they look at our canonical Gospels recording sayings of Jesus that probably passed through some sort of oral tradition, the memory of the original Gospel writers, etc., etc., so when we read our Bible, we're reading a translation of a translation that went back through its own tradition to Jesus. And so when we compare these two lines of tradition, we're going to have to be somewhat generous in how we understand them. When we look at the parallels, we have to determine, is this meant to be an honest parallel? Maybe it doesn't sound exactly like, but if it's close enough, if it's trying to sound alike, 
then we're going to assume that any differences are simply due to these differences in transmission and translation. But then, when it comes to some instances, we might see intentional changes. Maybe this is something different altogether, and that's what it's going to be tough for us to decide. Let's look at a few examples. In the Gospel of Thomas, we hear Jesus say, Anyone here with two good ears had better listen. Sounds really forceful. Sounds like Jesus is really making you know. It's the imperative. You better listen. Well, that's probably a parallel. Like, we're going to give credit here to what we actually read in our canonical Gospels when Jesus says things like, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, in that sort of King James-ish English, let him hear, Jesus sounds so polite, that sounds so nice of Jesus to give us the option, but it's not an option in the original Greek. It's still in an imperative. It's just in a curious Greek construction that's sort of hard to translate. And yes, it's true that uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, he who has two good ears, but better listen. Well, in, in our Bible, Jesus just says, he who has ears. How many? Doesn't say. Ears plural, at least two or more, probably not three. So I think we can assume this is meant to be a parallel. And any different sounding words uh, is just simply due to translation. But now let's take another example. In our canonical Gospels, Jesus says things like, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you, and he starts to list all the things that they should be woeful about. Again, such a polite sounding Jesus, woe to you. It's like you would say gently to your favorite horse, woe, easy. But when you read the Gospel of Thomas, and you're going to have to pardon my French, this is what it's translated as saying. Jesus said, damn the Pharisees, for the Pharisees, and he goes on and explains their problems. And even though some of the content as to what he's going on to is going to go on to say about the Pharisees does differ in these different Gospels, but sometimes it's parallel. And a saying like this, I mean, after all, in the nice King James sounding English, when Jesus says, woe to you Pharisees, he's not gently stroking his mare while out for a Sunday afternoon horseback ride. He is warning them with all seriousness that this is a problem that affects their souls. This is a, a woe, uh, a warning of their condemnation. So, yes, even though we normally wouldn't want Jesus saying things in such harsh language, you can't bring this kind of translation into Sunday school, we still have to admit that when we look at the Gospel of Thomas and it says this line, it's meant to be parallel with the, the lines we have in our canonical Gospel. Now, when we know there are parallel lines meant to be parallel, that then brings into question other times where there seem to be parallel lines, but now the change is enough that it might be more than just translation. It might be intentional uh, change in meaning. Well, let's look at one case in particular. A famous parable of the lost sheep told in our Synoptic Gospels. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus once again tells this parable about a kingdom is like a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one of them, now this time it's the largest, who knows why, the one sheep left the 99 uh, and went away. But Jesus left the 99 and looked for the one. And after he found it, this is the important change, Jesus says to that sheep, I love you more than the 99. Now, here's where we have to debate. Is this an intentional, malicious twisting of the truth? Did some evil Gnostic heretic take Jesus' uh, parable and twist it to mean something different? Like Jesus really loves us Gnostics. Yeah, we're smaller than the wider big church, but Jesus loves us more than the rest of the church. Maybe. Or is this, like every translation, simply an interpretation? When you try to tell this story or retell this story, or if this is how Jesus was remembered as telling the story, at some point on all this translation, someone added this line, explain, why did he leave the 99? It's because he loved the one. 
maybe that's just an innocent interpretation. Maybe someone thought that just as narrow is the way, many are called, few are chosen, there seems to be a sort of special favor God has on the elect. And maybe they thought this is what Jesus was teaching when the when, when Jesus talked about leaving 99 sheep to go for one sheep. Now, which is right? That sort of suspicious understanding of this or the sympathetic understanding of this? Well, who's to say? There is no commentator that goes along with this text. There's no extra way to, to know for sure. That's one of the difficulties with the Gospel of Thomas. It's just saying after saying after saying. And when all is said and done, you're left having to interpret Which way do you think is the right way to interpret these alleged parallels? Okay, so now now that we've explored how the Gospel of Thomas might relate to the canonical Gospels, and now that we sort of know what to look for when comparing statements that seem similar between the two, now we want to know, what does this text say? Well, we're going to look at that in the next video. We're going to see a lot of examples, try to help Um, get a sense of what this text might mean and what might that tell us about some of the earliest Christians who used this text or believe Jesus said these words. So, hope to see you in the next video.